Ooh, it's all on the line. And here goes nothing. <laughs> taking a chance. Here goes nothing. I'm taking a chance. My new acting coach says, it's all about play. You're supposed to go out there and play and have a good time. So are we going to play and have a good time? Yeah. yeah. You're ready to play and have a good time. So the title of my talk is Gold Go. I wanted to make it play ball, but it just didn't ring right at this time of year. For some reason, I don't know. But anyway, goal to go. So it's the third yard line. It's the fourth down. And it's goal to go. And your team has got three yards to make their goal. And you're in the stands screaming for your team. And somebody says, set. I don't know who says that. Somebody says, set. And they all get really mean looking, you know. And I was wondering what might be going through their minds as they see the goal over there. I mean, could, they could be listing the reasons that they might not make their goal. I mean, they lost the last four games. Yeah. Number 23 is out with a concussion. The, the other team outweighs them probably 30 pounds per man. You know, I mean, it's not looking really. I got a sprained ankle. They taped it, but I don't know. You know, no, no, they're not. That's not where they're at. So now the fans are like stomping. I love this part. You know, and everybody's stomping and, we're, and there's like this roar starts up and the, and the whole stadium is vibrating with energy. And they're like laser focused on this one thing. Everything else dissolves. They can't see anything else. It's like in that moment, in that moment, you see nothing else. You see just that one thing. And they can't stop. They don't care how much they get pounded. They don't have to say, excuse me, did I step on your cleat? <laughs> You know, I don't know. I don't think they do that. But yeah, so they're just like focused on that goal. And they can't stop. They won't stop until they go all the way. All the way. As far as they can go. Ernest Holmes wrote this. To be free from the bondage of fear and anxiety, the mind must be riveted on freedom. Those players are riveted. Now, the other team's riveted too, but we're not talking about them today. That's not my team. That's not your team. We're talking about the winning team. Here. So um, he also says, the mind and heart must be open to the influx of divine intelligence. It's like in, in any moment in the darkness, the light shines and can shine. And, in, and we suddenly see through whatever the obstacle appears to be, whatever that stuff is for us. We can suddenly see through it to the answer, to whatever it is, to the answer. And the inspiration can come in a flash. And we suddenly know. We just suddenly know. So um, the last three weeks I've been spending with a dear beloved of my heart who's going through a very difficult, painful, physical challenge. And um, so 10 days we were waiting for a, uh, the results of tests so that we could begin, she could begin on, on a temporary uh, relief and a long-term healing. So the day came and it was Monday. And all day long, she called and couldn't get the doctor to return a call. So, and they closed at 4.30. So she called finally back again, and the nurse said, well, yes, the results are on her desk, but she's so busy, I'm not sure that she'll be able to read them and call you back today. Now, if you're waiting 10 days in intense pain, unrelenting pain, that's not okay. So she was not okay with that. And I was not with her at the time. I was home, and she was in Encino. So I'm driving in my car, and as I got in my car, I began blessing this doctor, blessing all the individuals who stepped up, who made space for her when they had a month's waiting list for new patients, a doctor, an acupuncturist who drove from Orange County after working a full day to meet her in San Fernando to give her assistance because he could sense the desperation there. So I was, ble I just, I was so full of gratitude. I just thanked these individuals for dedicating their lives for all the people that I blessed her practice, that it would be successful. I blessed her husband who had spinal fusion. I blessed his immediate, his immediate and complete healing. I blessed the acupuncturist that his, that his, uh, his practice would, would swell and grow. And I just, the, I, I just kept doing it all the way, 25 minutes, pouring out blessings to all these individuals who serve everyone, every, that's their whole thing. They're just in life to serve. That's all they're doing. So I was just blessing, blessing, and I got so joyful that I was in the, I'm on the 405 laughing and crying at the same time and going, woo, woo. So I stepped in the house, and it's okay because I'm not going to see them again. I, di I didn't know them. And 
So I stepped in the house, and I could see from her face that they had not called, and it was about 10 minutes before closing. And I, don't know, I went to get a drink of water, and the phone rang, and I said, yes, thank you, God. And it was the doctor. So that night, I was facilitating the practitioner class for Reverend James, who's laying on the sand in Kauai while I'm doing the practice. But it's OK. I'm not upset. It's fine, James. It's really fine. So, so I said, so I shared that with the class. And I said, what do you think happened there? I mean, anything? Was it anything at all? And they said things like, you know, you were, you were, you were so grateful and pouring out love with that gratitude and blessings on all these individuals. And they said really great stuff. And then David Allen Cruz, I love what he said. He said you were moving energy. And I love that. Moving energy. See, everything is energy. And that's what spiritual mind treatment does. It moves energy. And we do that all the time, most of the time unconsciously. But we can also do it consciously. And when, I, when we, our ministers and practitioners, and you, take the time to consciously align with the infinite power that is unmovable, unstoppable, and unchangeable, and know that it is everywhere present, therefore where I am, it has to be. And if it's everywhere present, then it's not only around me, it must be in me too. And when I take the time to become that, and I speak my word, it's God speaking the word. It's life speaking the word. It's mind speaking the word. It's not me. It's like we, di we dissolve into it. And not to the loss of our individuality, but to become part of the greater. It's like that power that's greater than we are in the universe that we can use. That's what we mean. To become part of that greater so that when you're standing in your truth and speaking it, you don't, you can't be moved. Just like those guys on the offensive line, they can't be moved. They know what their goal is, and they're not backing down. They're not backing down. So um, if I don't take the time to recognize what the power is, where it is, where it comes from, and how I connect with it, if I don't take the time to do that, then it's just Nancy B. hoping that you really wanting you to feel better. Be better, be happier. I mean, truly, that's what it is. That's not what practitioner work is. That's not what spiritual mind treatment is. It's not that. And I was talking in my class on Wednesdays that we tend to spend most of our time in the third part, which is, yeah, I really want him, and he's this tall, and he's gorgeous, and he's blonde, and he has blue eyes, and he rides a horse, and he has a Harley and a ranch, and, you know, whatever. That's where we tend to spend, you know, the treatments, one is like this, two is like that, and three is like, whoa! Okay, so we're going to switch that around. We're going to make one and two the time in a, and if you don't understand what I'm talking about, just affirmative prayer. It's recognizing the vastness, the immensity of spirit, the creator and creation, which is all the same thing. It's all one stuff, one thing we're creating all the time, too, Sometimes unconsciously and sometimes consciously. But when we do it consciously, it's so powerful when we do that. Um, Reverend Cliff Rubin wrote a little book, a little pamphlet called Cliff's Notes on the Science of Mind. I really recommend it. Reverend James does as well. Because um, it's really little and the textbook's really big. So, you know, it's like, like that. So anyway, he wrote this. He wrote this, once we're able to stand in the truth without wavering, we will be able to heal the sick and walk on water. But even if we do waver, the more we're willing to return to stand in truth, the more loving, kind, and compassionate our lives will be. The more our lives will, look, will feel and look and be as we want them to be. Has anybody done any wavering in the last week? <laughs> I have. I've got to tell you, I have. But I said to my, pra my, um, my prayer partner on Friday, Lori Donato, I said, but we know where center is. We know where center is. We know when we're on it, and we know when we're off. And we have spiritual tools to help us get back on. We use affirmations. We use affirmative prayer. We call a prayer partner. We sing songs. I, sing, I do mantras over and over of the positive things when my mind won't shut down 
about the fearful things or anxiety or aching for my beloved who's suffering. I have to do those things to get my mind because I'm not helping. Over there, I'm not helping. I need to keep myself centered in the truth and stand in that truth and absolutely know that right where she is, God is. Right where she is, health is, wholeness is, peace is, power is. The presence is of love and joy and bliss and all those good things. Joe Dispenza wrote, it's really important to become aware of our self-talk and to take responsibility for us, for it. Um, so um, anybody spends time with an extended family on Turkey Day? Yeah. We had, I think, 28 or 29, I lost count. We had three new babies this year and a new one last year, so we're multiplying very quickly. I have to learn how to knit faster because I'm falling behind. I'm falling behind. So anyway, Turkey Day was about to come, and um, the sister of my beloved was going to come up and spend time with her. And I went, great, I'll go home. I haven't seen it for a while. I'll go home. And my, my sweet beloved said, no, no, stay. Stay for dinner. We'll visit. And then you can go home. And I said, no, she wants to see you. She doesn't want to see me. And that kind of clunked. I didn't like that. I didn't like that, the way that felt. So I, I looked at it a little bit, and I said, what, what's underneath that? Where's that coming from? She doesn't want to see me. And I thought, if, we're in a, if the world's a mirror and mirrors back to us what we put out into it, what if I flip that around and see what that says? I don't want to see her. Okay, that's where the work is. So that's part of those old dead beliefs that no longer work for us, that we don't even know are operating. But until we're willing to bring them out of the darkness into the light so we can see it and then deal with it, is that what I want? No, it's not what I want. I want, I want, us to, I want a loving relationship. I want us to be sweet together and have fun together and go places and do things together like we have in the past. So I said, this is what I said, I refuse to allow skeletons of old dead beliefs to run my life. They're, they're old dead things. I'm not letting my life be run by that. So here's what I know. When I change the way I look at the world, the world changes. But the world's not going to change till I change. So when I went to Turkey Day, did I, I noticed a little bit of stuff there. Of course, I put it there, didn't I? <laughs> so I can't look over there to get it changed. I need to look in my own heart. And that's where the healing takes place. And that's where the healing is done now. And that's what I claim for myself. So let's say that when I, when I change, the world changes. Let's say that. When I change, the world changes. That's how it happens. And no other way. Absolutely no other way. So um, in uh, end of October, beginning of November, I had uh, three auditions, really back to back, like about in a seven day period, uh, on, at Paramount, Warner Brothers, and MGM, which is now Sony. Now I have not been on any of those three lots since I quit the industry in 1990. So I had these three, I got a new theatrical agent, he sent me out twice, I got two callbacks, and so I was at MGM for this callback. And it was on a Monday. And it was just sweet, because I met my husband at MGM on that lot. And he's not with us anymore, but it, it was just so sweet. And um, you park like miles away and walk, and I passed a coffee bean. So when I was done with my audition, which went okay, I thought. I wasn't jumping up and down. I thought it went okay. I went to the coffee bean. And there were people sitting outside. It was a sunny day. And they're sitting outside and, and drinking their coffee. So I got me coffee. And I sat in the coffee bean outside with all the people at MGM. And I sat there and drank my coffee. And it was at a corner. And I was just sitting there being part of it. Just being part of it. I wasn't anxious. I wasn't worried about the job. I wasn't, there was nothing going on except I was loving being there. It felt so good. It just, it felt right. And it felt normal. It felt normal to be there and be a part of all of that. 
So that week, I didn't think very much about it. You know, I used to stress about, well, I get it, I don't know. I should have worn the, 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 the red skirt instead of the brown skirt. That would have done it. I know, you know, it's like, I didn't do any of that. It was just, I was just happy. All week long, I just had this little glow going on inside. And so Sunday night, 9 o'clock, the phone rings. You just got the booking. You're showing up Monday morning. And I worked three days on a sitcom. Is that three? Yes, three days on a sitcom for the executive producer who was a producer on Friends. I think it's going to be a hit. And, and it was just a total love fest, the whole thing. From the time I got there until the time I left, we just fell in love with each other. And it was just like a party. Like we started Christmas early, and we were having our celebration early, and they invited me. And we were just all playing together this wonderful game called, you know, let's make believe and make this fabulous uh, TV show. So what I learned, I wrote a book a few years back called Life is a Game and You Can Play It. And what I got about a month ago, right, right before I went to Paramount, what I got is this really is all a game. This stuff that we're doing, it's really all a game, and we're just playing our parts. So once I figured that out, see, the casting directors became my playmates, and the studios became my playground. So I was just having fun, where before there was all this anxiety about it, and all this, you know, trying, and hoping, and working, and I just went and had a good time, and got the booking. So it's awesome. I love that. And yesterday, Saturday, I got home for a couple of hours, check on my cat, who I accidentally locked in my roommate's room. But uh, she's okay. I've been apologizing ever since. I feel so bad. But anyway, she's okay. So I got home, and I checked my mail. It was like this deep, and I checked my mail, and there was a check from SAG. I get residuals from the stuff I did in the 80s, and they're like $11, you know? So, and, and less. And so I, there were, but there were two of them. So I opened the first one was eleven dollars and seventy six cents. Oh, well, okay. And the second one was one thousand twenty six dollars residual check from Hot in Cleveland. See, that was a four camera live show. So I thought it worked like after, and you didn't get residuals. So I'm like, woo! So it's life is really a game, and the more we play, the in, and let go of all the angst that kind of blocks the good that we want, the more fun we have. And see, the things that we, that, we, that we fear, that we blame, that we condemn, that we judge, they stick to us in our energy field like glue. And every time we rehearse that again, we run that tape again, that thing they did back in 1976. <laughs> it's really old news, nobody cares. Nobody even remembers it anymore. Every time we rehearse that, we we're pouring gasoline on the fire and wondering why it never goes out. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's our responsibility to check out what that stuff is that's going on in our mind and be willing to heal it. Absolutely. Uh, Ed Edward Villon wrote this. It's the attitude with which you do a thing that determines the nature of its results. It's not what you do, it's how you do it. The simplest thing done with so much love can just warm your heart in such a great way. So I know that when I change the way I look at the world, my world changes. So Karen Mitchell's wonderful song said, so here goes nothing, I'm taking a chance. I'm opening up knowing we're in good hands. So here goes everything. It's all on the line. It's the fourth down, third yard line, and goal to go. But we're not afraid this time because we're okay. We've always been, and it will always, always, always be that way. Namaste.